Okay, guys, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm with a very special guest, Dr. Joe Delaney. Uh, Joe is a PhD in medicine and a specialist in neuroscience dealing with um, stress and addictive behavior, Joe, yeah? Yep, yep. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you over to Joe now just so he can discuss about who he is and what he does, um, and then we'll crack on. Joe, down to you. Thanks very much, Jane. Thanks very much for inviting me. Pleasure, to sir, pleasure. Um, who am I? Well, I'm a PhD in medicine. I am not a doctor of medicine, but I'm a doctor in medicine. Okay. Right, and what that means is I've done... Um, I spent seven years basically analyzing the effects of psychological stress on people's hearts yep. and the rest of their body. Surprisingly enough, I found out that what was going on between their ears in, impacts, <laughs> impacts considerably on how their heart works and how the rest of their body works as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. And over time, uh, what I've found out is that we can use simple breathing techniques and we can use positive emotion to turn around the effects of stress. Yep. And we could, it's all about the heart, really, to try and come out of the, the craziness that we've got in the world now and to focus on the heart. Uh, using positive emotion, we can change the way the heart works to change the way the head works to help people to make better quality choices. Really. Fantastic. And you're, you're doing something now with an I am um, on Facebook. I've seen, do you want to just explain to everyone what that yeah, is? Yeah, I've developed a, um, an approach, if you like. It's called the I am approach. And I am stands for internal asset management it's what's called a, a strength-based approach. Because generally what we tend to do is, in the Western world particularly, we focus on people's weaknesses, you know, and we try to make them strong in the area yeah. where they're weak, you know, which makes sense. But if you focus on what's strong naturally in a person first and foremost and work with that, then we get more motivation, more enthusiasm. Absolutely. And then when they feel more uh, self-worth and self-esteem building, their motivation, their direction, their purpose, and everything else changes, really. So it's a change. I am, as I say, stands for internal asset management. The assets are their instincts, their natural born instincts. Yeah. And in the world that we live in, we tend to have suppressed and repressed a lot of the natural abilities in ourselves. Yeah. So it's really um, disentangling them and unlocking them from all the social conditioning yeah. that's really kept people down, you know. So people more and more are waking up, you know, there seems to be a global wakening up where people are realizing that maybe they've been holding themselves back. It's really about people finding their true essential selves and working from there and almost creating a new life from their core. Fantastic. Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Jay Dignam. I am a personal trainer and a sports therapist. Um, and over the past 15 years, I've been doing as much as I can within the clinical and the sport environment. I now own an academy that fuses clinical sciences with a sport and application. Um, so what I do is I try and teach uh, you know, health practitioners, sports practitioners, how we can find a different approach than using pharmaceuticals and rehabilitation. Um, and I was once a, a, a student of Joe, so it's an absolute honor to have Joe, Joe with me today, you know, to delve back into his mind. Uh, so we're gonna hit it straight off. Now what we're gonna try and do now is we're gonna try and hit about depression, mental health, motivation. We're gonna talk about emotional pain uh, and, and really what we can do on, you know, on, on the therapeutic side, the holistic side, and obviously the, the, the sort of sporting side as well. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at what is anxiety and depression, and we're gonna look at it from a clinical point of view. So Joe, if you'd just like to explain to us what, what, what is mental health, you know, what is anxiety and depression, please? I think we need to focus more on psychological well-being, I think, you know. There's, yeah. But we talk about uh, there's a lot of med mental health problems, and people think that's just to do with thinking. But it's much deeper than that because we have conscious thinking and then we've got the emotional side of thinking. It's, and most people are totally unaware of how emotions process, you see. So we can, for example, we can say, I really feel motivated to not eat any chocolate cake for the next month, yeah. you know. And they really, really mean it and they grit their teeth and get on with it. But after about 10 days, a thought comes in, well, I've really worked hard today. I really deserve just a small yeah, piece of cake. See what absolutely, I mean? Yeah, so absolutely. We've yeah. got this competing interest within ourselves. We've got the conscious mind and what I call the other than conscious mind. And generally speaking, over time, we can change behavior in the short term 
for our old habits to re-emerge from the depth, you see. And that's very important, that, because what we need to know is we can obviously use cognitive techniques to change our mind, but for long-term effect, we need to go in into the unconscious or other than conscious, yeah. and we need to re-script old habits and old patterns of behavior. Fantastic. So I, I would like to see, uh, rather than talk about mental health, is talk about psychological, psychological well-being. Health. So we have, to use the technical terms, cognitive, affective and psychomotor they're the, they're the parts of a person's brain and how they process and what what do those three mean Jared? so cognitive just means our hand. conscious thinking really yeah so we can go to somebody who'll say well stop thinking like that and think like this you know and we can try that yeah but over time um, people generally know what they need to change you know and to have somebody else reinforce that all the time can be a bit um um, you can get a bit resentful. Yeah, you, you absolutely, know, yeah. Because you can work that out for yourself. Yeah, 100%. But most people don't know that it's the emotional side and it's those deep sort of uh, repressed and suppressed feelings that are really causing all the problem. So um, we need to open up gently this Pandora's box of repression and we need to guide people through and allow this almost like this atomic energy, right, this quantum energy, if you like, yeah. it's being called now to come to the surface and transform the way we behave, you see. And when we do that, we can make the heart work in a different way because, as I say, the heart's an oscillator. Yeah. It sends out signals. It sends blood pressure waves back to our brains, right? But it also sends electromagnetic energy back to our brains, which can change the way our brain waves work, which can help us to make more positive choices. You know, it's a bit, um, some people used to think that this is woo-woo, but it's now backed up very much now by quantum science. With the, the clientele I work with on a daily basis, you know, a lot of these guys are broken and, and uh, you know, cognitively down. What I sort of noticed is like social trends. So there would be like social trends where these guys would come in and they were really, really high and they didn't know each other. And then there would be times where I would come into work and I would be dealing with these clients and they would all be really, really low. You know, it is the... Is there social trends in, in like how depression takes place? You know, does does the way that we live is what we're watching? Does that affect the, the, you know depression, if you know so to speak, in terms of like how we all get depressed and all get low at the same time? Because that's what I notice quite a lot. I noticed that we were all really happy and then we were all really low together. Yeah, yeah. You know, does does that have an effect? The social trends, does our environment, what we are together, does that have an effect? Yeah, it's called epigenetics. We, um, our body processes information emotionally, right? Which then goes on. My, my field, people ask me, what do you really do? You know, yeah. and I, I say I'm a consultant in psycho neuro endocrino immunohematology. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and they say, they say swear words then, you know. <laughs> and I say, in other words, it's called integrative medicine or holistic medicine or vibrational medicine. And what we're doing is, as I mentioned before, is we're consciously processing information, but there's four-fifths of us that are taking on board sensory information below the level of our awareness, you see. Yeah. So it's not like it isn't happening but we're picking up all sorts of invisible signals and our body and our mind is processing that all the time. And there are trends. I mean, if something, if, if a great disaster happens, we will pick up the general mood, you see. Absolutely. Now, the point is, that's all very well and good, but if we don't know on an individual level how to be tolerant of our emotional reactions, that's what drives us down, you see. Yeah. So we need to go into becoming more conscious of our unconscious. It's almost called the hero's journey. You know, oh, where we have to take our eyes from looking outwards all the time and start to look inwards and be responsible and personally responsible for our emotional reactions to life. And then when we do that, we can make healthier choices because we can mindfully take a step back, process information uh, more healthily and therefore have a better quality of life. Now, obviously, you know, people that uh, watch my, my sort of podcasts and blogs understand I'm a little bit brutal in terms of how I go across. So I need to ask something that I think a few of my viewers would want me to ask is, is depression real? Is it real? Or are we just applying a label to something that we don't really understand or we haven't really, you know, delved into it? So, you know, I may get a little bit of backlash from this, but I just want to send it out there in any way is, is it real? Is it really real? Or are we just feeling sad? Are we just feeling down? Is our body untrained? Is our mind untrained? And we're just getting labeled by who we get labeled by. And then we, you know, we, we conform to that because I, I find that it's easier to not do nothing. It's easier to feel sad. It's easier to feel upset. It's easier to, to get annoyed at everything because it, it takes less energy. You know, to stay motivated, to stay happy, to push forward in life, it requires a lot on, on our behalf. 
you know, and if someone labeled me with, oh, listen, you're depressed, you've got a borderline personality disorder, you're bipolar, you know, even me myself, and I'm a very motivated guy, I think I would just fall into the trend of giving up quite easy because it requires no energy on my behalf. So the, the question I'm asking you is, is it real? Good question, right? <laughs> we say depression, look at the word depression. You know, we've got depression, repression, suppression, and we've got expression. Yeah. Now, and if we've been brought up in a way where we're, we're told to hold back on our own feelings and we start to repress and suppress our emotional state, then that leads then to a sort of almost protective shell that internalizes, you know, and I believe that depression is the result of things like repressed anger, repressed resentment. It's because we live in such a politically correct environment. Absolutely. Right, that we sort of become chameleons where we're in a, um, an environment where we can feel our energy rise, you know, because we've, we've just heard something that we don't agree with. Yeah. But we swallow that down then. And then we sort of become a split personality. We say, it's awfully nice to see you when there's another part of us that wants to poke your eyes out. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think it's more to do with energy, this, and the way we use energy. In the end, it comes down to being authentic yeah. and to being true, real. You know, there's nothing wrong with saying, well, I disagree with what you've just said there. But, you know, if you've been brought up, give me the child until he is seven and I will give you the man. You know, what that really means is in the, in the early formative years of our life, our behavior is really set in stone then. And not many people until they become ill or some trauma happens do they actually turn around and realize that what's dri driving adult behavior is really coming from their first years of life. You see? Yeah. So I think that it's about helping people to reconnect with who they authentically are and to help them to shed all these um, inauthentic and pretentious ways of yeah, being. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so yeah. is depression real? Yes, I think it is. And I'm not in the slightest opposed to medical um, intervention at all. Yeah. If it's used for the right thing in the right quantities at the right time. Yeah. You know, my, my view is not to oppose anything. It's to work non-medical and medical interventions working together professionals working together, people in your field and my field, working with medicine to try and get the best package that will help the person. To Which is what we're going to go through later on down the line. We're going to look at, you know, where, where we go next. Uh, so next on the list, Joe, is... So what happens if we, we hold on to this negative energy, okay? And that's the way I like to see it. If I'm holding on to this negative energy, if I'm holding on to this trauma, um, and we're going to look at it from a cognitive point of view and a physical point of view. So how I, you know, how I've dealt with it and how you've dealt with it. So if we hold on to that stress, that negativity, that negative vibration, that negative energy, what can that do in the long run in terms of, you know, the, your cognitive health? Well... We think less clearly when we're under stress. Absolutely. You know, yeah. we, we might think that we're being smart and ducking and diving and dodging and weaving, but we don't see the whole picture. You know, we, can, we have a very narrow focus on life. And the reason I'm in this business, and you know this, uh, my enthusiasm yeah. is because after years of stress and anxiety and depression and alcoholism and addictive behavior, you know, I came to a point in my life where I seemed to have lost all purpose. Yeah. I was totally and utterly diagnosed with clinical depression, right? And I just felt that I had nowhere to go. And um, I made a really, really se serious attempt to, to do myself in, you know? Yeah. So and for years though, I was having suicidal thoughts, like maybe this is the day that I do it. Because what had happened to me is, not only could I not change the way I was working and thinking, that I was hurting a lot of people. Can I, can I just yeah. touch on something as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah. Is, is, is during that time where you were gonna commit suicide or you yeah. wanted to commit suicide, because I've lived with someone for a very long time now with a borderline personality disorder who, right. who's wanted to do that. And it's hard to, to deal with on, on a level outside, you know, looking at it from an outside perspective. During the time where you wanted to, you know, you wanted to end your life, what, what was going through your mind? I mean, did you think you, the, the world was better off? Did you just, yeah, yeah. Did you just give in? Yeah, yeah. Like, what was going through your mind personally where you were like, this is it, I've had enough? My cognitive mind was telling me, yes, you can. Yeah. Right, but something deeper in me, I mean, you mentioned- And I'm glad you've just said that. I'm glad you, you said know, that because we'll touch on that. Yeah, my, my cognitive mind said, yes, you can, but something in me, which is my affective emotional domain, was dragging me down all the time, you see. So the problem was, I knew what I needed to do but it was lack of power to change that was the problem. And it was not until somebody actually showed me. I mean, I, I went through this whole process, and I, I mean, I should, be, I should be gone, 
Yeah. Right? But thank God I'm not, you know. Absolutely. And, um, it's almost like I got the idea that maybe I could just wipe the slate clean and start again, right? And I ended up in the psychiatric department at Clatterbridge Hospital, and this whole process started unraveling me, that maybe I'd not been living my own life from my essential self or core self, that I'd listened to too many other people's ideas on what I should do. And really what I needed to do was turn away from that sort of societal intellectual conditioning Right, because I wasn't thick, I was doing a PhD. Yeah, absolutely. So, so cognitively, I had the capacity to think okay. Right, but it was all to do with my feelings and my emotions and my moods. A lot of people give in and say they're not worthy enough, they're not going to do nothing. And, and to be honest, Joe, if you'd have ended your life that time, I came out of the military before I met you. Uh, I had a very bad time. I ended up in military prison for, for being in, insubordinate, okay? I was a very <laughs> naughty boy. That's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I just, I, I knew I had this, this other call and the military is hard and I come out and I, I come out as a yes man and I was around a society full of people that were, were no people. People, you know, just didn't want to drive. And I got very, very depressed. And I had a little bit of money. And I knew science was my forte. I knew science was where I, I was going to go. And I went down to the college. And I went in and I met uh, Jen. Yeah, Jenny. Jen, Gundam. Jenny. And she, uh, and, and Joe, I lied. I lied about everything. I lied about my, my GCSEs. I lied about, you know, everything. I lied my way into college. And... You know, at the, at the back end of that, I had a choice. I could either pay my way through college or I was going to pay my way and get a home and just sort of crack on with life. And I decided to become homeless. And I spent nine months living in Bidston Hill. Yeah. And I was getting showers on the people's taps every single morning. It was freezing cold. I was living on sausages and cooking them on a hexy stove. You know, I had a really, really bad time, a really rough time. But I knew, I had this visualization at the end of it that I was going to be okay. Everything was going to be okay. And I suffered, you know, I proper suffered. It was, it was terrible. And at the same time, you know, I was a skinny, spotty kid. I had low confidence. Uh, I had a kyphotic neck, you know. It was, a, it was a horrendous time in my life. And my point is, is people think that they've got nothing to offer in the world. And there's, there's, there's times where I've spent with you in Birkenhead Park where you've been talking about the course and you've been giving us a lecture in the park after we've done a run. And if it, if it wasn't for you at the time, I wouldn't be as successful as I am now. If it wasn't for you at the time, your enthusiasm about science, it wouldn't have rubbed off and they'd just give in. And my point is... is you, you never know what's around the corner. You know, you never know. You, the, everyone is special. Everyone is unique. And if, if, you, if you weren't there, I don't think my life would be the same now. Maybe I would have went down the route of drugs and alcohol. Maybe I'd want to kill myself, you know. Maybe I'd have still been living in Bidston at this point. But my point is, is, you know, you never know. You never know how much of an impact. And you haven't just had an impo- impact on my life. You've had an impact on, on thousands of people who you've taught. But I know if, if you'd have went that day, I think I'd have went later on down the line. A lot of people watching this now will say, well, have you ever had depression? How can you talk about depression if you've never had it? I mean, I've got to say, I think me and you have both been in, in situations where most people couldn't fathom, yeah. you know, how stressful and how bad it was. And if it went for you and the knocking effect you had on me, I honestly think I'd still be homeless now, you know. I don't think I'd have a lovely daughter. I don't think I'd have a great business. I don't think I'd have this. You're going to make me go here. I can can feel those feelings coming up I don't think I'd have this sort of epistemology for knowledge. I just, uh, I think, you know, you you understand what I'm trying to say? I don't, you've got to. I think you've got to pass it on because what they say, you've got to give it away to keep it, you know what I mean? Mm. And I think there's no such thing as a hopeless case. People didn't give up on me, you know, they yeah. kept going and because they could see a potential in me. But rather than feeding me with more information, which clogged my head up, right, they, they told me how to lead a more heart-centered life, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because my head's full of information, I was always able to duck and dive and dodge and weave yeah. and, and come up with words and stuff like that. But people could see straight through me. These are people who'd been through the process yeah. and they got right to the core, right to the heart of the matter. And I was afraid. It was fear. I I feel um, a bit sad talking about this. But fear, um, it's an evil and corroding thread. 
And I think the fabric of everybody's existence at some level is shot through with it. And our DNA is fear conditioned. You know, we're not taught in this society to, to live with our strengths. People direct us probably away from our strengths into some sort of um, conditioning which benefits them rather than ourselves. You see, that's changing now. There's a whole big change in global understanding now that in some way we've been naive enough to take on board other people's opinions. And no, absolutely. You know, and I think my job now is to help people to reconnect with who they really are, essentially, and to try and help them to create from who they are. You know. Yeah. So I'm glad that I'm on this side of it. But when I was going through, because I too was homeless, I used to sleep in the park. I would be scrabbling around for cigarette ends and for pennies and stuff like that. You know. So people generally don't know that about me. In three days' time, it will be 27 years since I've had a drink of alcohol. Congratulations. Right? or any other mind-altering substances. I've stopped smoking, <laughs> right? You know, that's okay. I, I, yeah. But no, I don't run to anything uh, to ingest it now, to change chemically yeah. the way that I feel. Because I believe that... 27 we've got, years, Joe. We've got an inner pharmacy. You know, we've talked about this. We can talk about yeah. dopamine. We can talk about serotonin. We can talk about beta endorphin. We can talk about dimethyltryptamine and stuff like this. Yeah. All these things, if you express yourself in a particularly creative way... All these things realign, you know. This this is not woo woo. This this is no no science. absolutely. You know that if we get all our autonomic nervous system working in harmony, then the feelings of life change, and it, it sort of motivates you to go on then to um, to choose and be honest about what you want in life, but also to help other people if you can as well. Absolutely. So I, I see that now is the joy of living is my theme because I was miserably, miserably happy, pretending to be happy for years. Yeah. And I just wanted to die. I wanted. I woke up every morning thinking, I wish it was over, you know. Yeah. I don't feel like that anymore, mate, you know. Fantastic. I wake up and I feel like I've got something more to do. Sad to me is seasonal affective disorder. You know, do the seasons change the way oh, that we Yeah, feel? absolutely. Of course they do, because we've lost our understanding about natural rhythms and things like that, you know. More and more people now are affected by sleep disorder than has ever been known, really. You know, and there's many, many reasons for that. But principally, it's because of our pineal gland, which is really the biorhythm center of the body. Stress affects the way our pineal gland works, right? Which then affects our pituitary gland, which affects all the other glands as well. But, um, and of course, obviously, a lack of sleep as well affects the, the well, physiology, like the heart, yeah, yeah. you know, lungs, everything else. Well, it affects the way melatonin is produced and all those things interact with the way adrenaline is produced. Our kidneys become overworked, you know, we can get chronic muscle tension because stress to me means um, stress, anxiety and depression. That's sad to me. Yeah. You know, and I think that's where we are is that we're not taught to listen to what our body's trying to tell us. You know, it would be nice if it shouted out, have a rest now, you know, but stress is very, very simply, according to the health and safety executive of Britain, right, is excessive pressure or other types of demands placed upon us. So when we're in a situation of excessive pressure, we will perceive a threat. Yeah. When we perceive a threat, we automatically go into what's called the fight or flight response. Sympathetic, parasympathetic, yeah? Absolutely. But what actually happens is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest response, is curtailed. And the sympathetic fight or flight response kicks in, you see. Right. Then our blood pressure goes up. Our heart rate increases. We get a grip in the gut. We need to take in more energy in the form of carbohydrates and fats. You know, because yeah. our body signal, I need energy, give me food, give me sustenance. Well, I actually want to come back to that, the sympathetic okay. nervous system, because I know this down regulates the, the, the digestion process. And I understand like the microbiome okay, is absolutely. affected, which absolutely. can then affect endotoxins and so on and so forth. So I really want to come back to that sympathetic, okay. parasympathetic nervous yeah, yeah. system as well. Um, so anxiety, people say, what is anxiety? It's a feeling. And anxiety, the root word of anxiety is something called angustia. It's from the Latin. It means a tightening or a narrowing. And I associate it with a tightening or a narrowing of the throat. Yeah. And not a lot of people, what I'm going to tell you now, and you don't know this yet, because I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Hit me, why, baby. Why, under fight or flight, why in defensiveness does the throat close? I'll ask you a question and see if you were paying attention. Too late. Oof. Okay. But the larynx, right, and the pharynx, right, there are two nerves there. They close down the throat to increase the oxygen pressure, right, in the lungs. Okay. So that oxygen is delivered more readily now. The heart quickens up. 
to take the blood round more quickly so that our oxygen is delivered to the muscles so we can go into fight or flight, depending wow. on how we perceive the situation. Now, what I teach people is something called the I am approaches, deliberately developmental, mindfulness-based stress re-education. Sounds posh, okay. I love it. <laughs> but what it means is, if we can help people to reconnect with their bodies, they will be able to feel the fight or flight coming in and they can then decide whether to nip it in the bud by using mindful breathing techniques, take a step back, reevaluate the situation, or whether they can go forward and take some action. Most of the stuff that we automatically respond to is not worth bothering about. Yeah. You know, the only time we really need the fight or flight response in this so-called civilized world is when our physical danger is threatened on that spot there. That's what we need it for. If you open up your email box and you've got 100 emails and you go into fight or flight, you know, that's an inappropriate activation of that mechanism. Yeah. And if we're in that for a long time and under this excessive pressure, that we're not working at our optimal well-being level, I call that owl, okay? So Fantastic. if you're a wise owl, right, you'll be able to actually feel what your body's saying, understand that that's a perception of threat, that's called fear. Yeah. And rather than going forward reactively, if we take a step back, open up, reevaluate the situation, most of the time it's not worth bothering about. Yeah. And that's what I really teach people now is reconnect with the body, get the heart working in a more coherent way. When the heart's working in a coherent way through mindful breathing and the use of positive emotion, it sends electromagnetic signals back to the brain. The brain calms down, it goes into what's called an alpha theta state, and then we can think more clearly because it expands our consciousness and then we can say, not worth bothering about. Yeah. This is all the, the premise of Tai Chi, Qigong, yoga, pranayama, all these techniques are all there to bring balance, not to bring relaxation, it's to restore balance. In yeah. fact, yoga means union. And what it means, Jay, is it means a union of the hemispheres. It means a union of the yin and yang within each cell of the body. And you can do that simply by taking a step back, breathing in a certain way, and then you can feel a calmness come in, and it's almost like your consciousness expands and everything becomes a much, the world becomes a better place. You know, I watched something recently, you know, I'm not a big fan of this guy. I watched a Ricky Gervais show not long back, because was Afterlife. And it's about a guy that had lost his wife and he wanted to commit suicide. And, and the, there's a woman within this scene that has, uh, she says something to Ricky and it really just hit home with me with, with what I was trying to say and she says that happiness is an amazing thing to, to, to be happy to want to be happy it doesn't have to be your happiness it, ha it can be anyone else's happiness to make you happy and what I've found in my work is people buy into me and I hate that you know, they buy into my motivation, they buy into my personality. And being sad and being happy, I think being motivated to want to get up and be happy all the time, it's not just about you getting up every single day and using, you know, certain, you know, writing things down on the mirror every single day. I am going to be great, I'm going to be happy. Or using Qigong or Tai Chi, you know, I've used Qigong in the past, meditation. It's not just about doing things for yourself. I think motivation comes from being around you. Happiness and being sad is an amazing thing because it does it doesn't have to be your sad for you to become sad. It doesn't have to be your depression for you to become depressed. If you're surrounded by toxic, you know, I apologize, shitty people, you know, you become toxic and shitty, you know, you become down and you be, you know, if, you, if someone around you become, calls you ugly all the time, you know, you will genuinely look in the mirror and have a body dysmorphic image that you're, you're ugly. And I feel that motivation just isn't about, you know, you getting up and using these things that we can apply right now and we can teach everyone to apply, but it's also about having the right people around you, having the right sort of friends, having the right work, you know, the work people around you. It's about, you know, your surroundings and your environment as well. So I wanted to sort of look at your point on motivation. I think you need to be internally motivated, right? Because yeah. if you depend on anything outside of yourself and that goes away, then you can lose motivation, you see. So yeah. motivation to me means it must come deep from your own core. Okay, and I agree with you. If you're trying to change your life and be more positive, it's stick with the winners, you know, but sometimes it's hard to detach yourself away from negative people. They may be in your family. In order to protect your own health, maybe you need to start. And this is this is a it's a it's deep, point. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a deep. deep point. But sometimes you may have to say to your family members, right? 
I can't be doing with that anymore. Yeah. I'm choosing to go to a more positive environment. Now, you may get all sorts of negative comments and you're changing, you don't care about me and all that. But once you start to care about yourself and your own health first, it helps you to help other people then in a different way, you know. We're all personally responsible for how we process information, you know. You know, people can, it's, it's very difficult this, but people can blame you for the way that they feel, right? That's giving your power away. That's disempowering yourself. Absolutely, That's, yeah, that's yeah. almost called victim consciousness, really. And sometimes you need to leave people to understand that it's the way that they're processing information that's making them feel bad, not what you're doing to them, you know. People only can, people can only hurt us or make us feel bad if we allow it at some, you know, depth, yeah. you know. So I help people also to maybe look deeper within them and to try and look at the, the behaviours and the ideas and the emotions. It's all to do with self-esteem and self-worth, you know. So on a motivational point of view, I don't believe personally in that rah, 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 yes, you can approach, right? It can work, but you've got to have the right motives deep down first and foremost, you know. And if you're, not work, if you're working from the mind first and not the heart, right, this is my personal experience, you know, then it's doomed to failure. That's my really yeah. yeah well, no, that's my feeling. So unless it's actually coming from the core first and foremost, then I think it's um, it's more of a psychological trick than anything else. I don't know what you feel about that. No, no, no. Because I, I know that you know you can motivate people in that way. Yeah, yeah, no. Right, and they can do it for you. But if they're not doing it for themselves first and foremost, my experience is that it's not going to <laughs> well, you know, A few of my clients that are watching this, a few of my ex-clients might, uh, might agree. I got to a point where, you know, watching people's force production strength, watching people's health deteriorate because they've gone through a bad time or giving me kind of excuses of, you know, why they haven't followed a certain nutritional program or why they've gone off and got pissed you know it got to a point where it was like listen you know it, it, it's not only bad for you it's bad for me because I'm creating this relationship where you're with I'm just resenting training you know yeah. and I think it has you know there's, there's, a, there's a point where you know motivating someone and empowering someone if they don't take it on themselves you know and do something about it it, it can become well let me stop you there right okay Point of contention, I don't think that you can motivate anybody else. Right? Okay. I don't think that you can empower anybody else. You can facilitate an environment where motivation comes from within them. You know, that's a different thing. Education means to draw out of, right? What we tend to do, though, is we tend to pour more information and more stress on people, which blocks them from actually expressing who they really are. So being a bit overbearing, would you say? In, yeah, yeah, in because... Trying, cause this is quite learning camp for me, Joe. Yeah, being yeah. overbearing in, you know, how, how you try and motivate someone, you get a little bit too overbearing, that can actually have a negative effect on someone. It can, because if, if what I'm saying before is true, which I believe that it is based upon my personal experience and helping loads of other people is, that if you put excessive pressure on a person the defense arousal response comes in and you actually go into what's called technically an ego contractive wow. state now in that response they'll become tense like their muscles become tense any excess physical work then can cause all sorts of muscle pain because they're always working against the resistance you see so what needs to happen is they need to relax emotionally their body needs to normalize itself and then the training needs to come in. You see. Fantastic. So, so on that rah, 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 yes, you can thing, that may work for some people, but it can actually put sensitive, emotionally sensitive people off. Because let me just say this, if on January the 2nd you say for the next month I'm not going to eat any chocolate, right, and people put pressure on you, you'll go to the chocolate more quickly because you're reaching yeah, out for yeah, chocolate. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Because it's being driven from a bigger and more powerful emotional response, you see. Yeah. Well, before we go into what we can actually do in training wise, I just yeah. want to talk about the sort of the, the medical aspect now, um, which is the drugs. Um, and I want to talk about the process, you know, of using drugs. And what I felt like is I've, I've trained thousands of people over the years, and every single person that I've trained that, ha that has a, a mental health issue that are on drugs, obviously, I've worked with their clinicians while I've been doing this, they, they've ended up coming off of the drugs. So before we go into do drugs help on a chemical level, what I want to talk about is, are we, are we creating depression by labeling someone depressed and, and then giving them a drug? Like what is the process of saying, okay, you are clinically depressed? Is it, 
Is it just an evaluation? Is there a blood test? You know, do we look at certain statistics that say, okay, this 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 statistic says that you are depressed, or are we just looking at best guess and saying, okay, you're clinically depressed. What we're going to do is we're going to give you this drug, and does that drug necessarily help you in terms of your you know your rehabilitation into uh, you know a more spiritual place, a more happy place? The answer to that is it's individual, right? Yeah. It's individual, it's so complex. And there are medications, and we're, we're talking about um, prescribed medications by doctors. Absolutely, Joe, Because yeah. non-medical prescriptions. No, you know, I know, you know, a lot you of know. people will go out and use alcohol, which is a drug in yeah. my eyes, it's still a drug. Yeah, yeah. You know, ethanol is still a drug. Yeah. They use cocaine, crack, you know, yeah. weed, whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, a drug is a drug in my eyes, and what I want to know is whatever drug that you're using, whether it be medically prescribed, or your dealer down the road is giving it to you, you know, does it really help? Is it a placebo? Are we in control more of our chemistry than we know? And is by giving a drug, is it just giving, you know, more emphasis on the fact that you have an issue if we, if we went through other alternative routes? When you, went to see, when you go and see a GP, you, he will ask you certain symptoms and he'll look for certain signs and things. Yeah. And then there's a particular manual that they go to and they, they, they mark it up and they say, this person has all the symptomatology of borderline personality disorder and stuff like that then. And then they look at another part to say, prescribe this because this has been shown to help. It depends on how it helps you see, because what I've learned is that most people are emotionally disturbed really. And what they need to do is grow through that emotional thing. So some drugs almost anesthetize you. So they don't treat the root cause of it, yeah. which is basically emotional growth needs to happen. They actually treat the symptoms. So people do temporarily feel better, right? Because it's sort of anesthetized and it changes the way their nervous system works. So they feel less. They don't feel more, they feel less. So when they feel less, it's almost as if things have improved. But in actual fact, what happens then is if the emotional disease hasn't been dealt with, it starts to increase in pressure. Yeah. And so they may then need more medication, you see, to anesthetize them. What happens, Joe, if we stay on this medication for too long, well, in your opinion? I, because my, my, my honest opinion is we're not really treating the root cause, which is people need. Uh, because I agree. I was the same. I was emotionally immature, didn't want to look at that. You know, cognitively, I use my cognitive consciousness to deal and duck and get out of situations when really I needed to grow up emotionally, you know. Yeah. And this is, this is it. It's difficult. It, you know, if you go to a GP and he says you need to grow up, you know, my mother was telling me all the time, you know, you need to grow up, son, you need to grow up. And she was right, <laughs> but she didn't know the steps that I needed to do and it's all about in my mind it's about facing fear right okay it's about facing fear at depth and really I got to a point where I was I got to a point where I was able to turn my eyes inwards and start to look at my emotional reactions to life because if I'm emotionally disturbed these days it's because my emotional components or my midbrain has detected a threat if you like yeah and what I do now is a step back I say why do I feel threatened here it's because you've said no when you really wanted to say yes, or you've said yes when you really wanted to say no. What's the solution? It's not to take a tablet, right, to feel good about your decision. It's to say yes when you've said no, and to yeah. say no. And so it's all about emotional growth. Does medication uh, prevent people in certain ways? Yes, I think that it does. Yeah. And once again, is I'm not opposed to medication at all, because yeah. I think in the short term, if it helps people to relax, because it will have some impact upon the way the nervous system works. I mean, it's been shown, you know. If it helps people relax, recuperate and restore some strength physically, then that's a positive thing. But if we're relying on medication in the long term, when it's really a growing up problem that we've got, then yeah. that to me is wrong, you know. So I think more and more GPs and more and more consultants that I'm talking to now are beginning to understand the impact of the emotional components of what it is to be human, you know. A lot of cognitive behavioral therapies have just dealt with think this way and take this action, you know. And people try to do that, I tried to do that myself. I tried to follow the instructions, right? It didn't work. And that's because I left out the midbrain components, yeah. which is, as you know, it's called the limbic system. It's all to do with the amygdala. When people are trying hard, but they get blocked by fear, that's known as the amygdala hijack. Okay. And, and more and more, the hijack basically sets you into fight or flight or fear or freeze. There's all sorts of different things. Some people can go forward. Most people go backwards, but some people go and they don't know yeah. which way to turn, you know. So it's to encourage people step by step to actually go through and walk through fear. Yeah. Because you know yourself is 
you know, if you've done something that you've been afraid of, when you come out the other side, you feel vitalized. Oh, absolutely. You feel energized and you're ready to go, you know. So, so my job is to help not to do anything for them, but just to help them to take the next step yeah. into freeing themselves from fear, really. Well, before we go into the next question, which is how does exercise actually help in improving your mentality, is prior to you going through your trauma and your sort of negativity, were you running at the time, Joe? No. Okay, which I want to I want to jump on board. So British Columbian University, and they done a study on the runners high, which we both know is is phenomenal, yeah. yeah. And they looked at like how exercise improved uh, cognitivity in a positive way. Yeah. And they said that by doing aerobic exercise, not resistance, okay, by doing aerobic e exercise, this improved the plasticity of the brain, of the hippocampus, uh, and also the cell proliferation, which is, you know, cell death to cell growth, the balance. Um, and they said that it increased, which, you know, in turn could be, by improving this could be a natural sort of antidepressant, if you like. I've seen personally how exercise improves you know, people's consciousness. I think it gives them more of a, a purpose in life, you know. Not only does it give you a purpose in life, but it gives you a, a connection to your body. And I want to touch on myelination. And myelination, guys, is basically the wrapping of fat around neurons, yeah. okay? So if you imagine, you know, back in the day, you know, I'm 87, I don't know about you, Joe, but when you used to get on the internet, you used to dial up and it used to take ages. And what I like to look at the neurons is like, an unmyelinated neural network is like AOL back in the 1980s. Yeah. A neural connection that's myelinated is a little bit like fiber optic broadband. Bang, it's Absolutely. straight there. Absolutely. And I feel like doing exercise, it gives you a connection, it gives you more myelination. This, this wrapping of fat about neurons that gives you a better connection, it gives you more empowerment to your body, more use, more feeling, you're more connected to who you are, you know, your vessel yeah. of what you are. And I feel like it's not just the hippocampus, it's not just, you know, the increase in hormones and the endorphins that make you feel better. I think it's a connection to the body. Being more connected to like who you are makes you a better person consciously, you know, cognitively, because if you're not really connected to your body, if you can't move well, if you can't hold yourself well, if you're not feeling good, if you're not really feeling your body, I think this has an effect on like your mind as well. And I don't know your thoughts on what exercise actually does to the body. Well, I know that there's obviously the aerobic sort of style of exercise has an effect on the brain by increased blood flow, increased oxygen. It's really good for the gray matter, the endorphins, the balance of hormones. I've done a lot of research into Bruce Lepton. This is a guy who, who dealt in uh, the, the nucleus on a cellular level. Yeah, epigenetics. Yeah, yeah he yeah. said that the the cell, the way it, it works is based on its environment. Yep. Okay, it reacts to the environment, you know, and if our environment is more intrinsically healthier and we're connected better and our nutrition is better, I feel that the cells will work better. No, no, I agree entirely. I mean, we talk about psycho neuro, endocrino, immunohematology, and all that means <laughs> is all that means is what goes on in your mind will electromagnetically send signals to your nervous system. Right. So depending on what's going on in your mind, that will determine the way your nervous system sends information to your endocrine glands. Then, you know, they secrete various hormones and biochemical substances. Are you with me so far? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Those substances will impact upon stem cell surfaces. Right. And depending on the information in that biochemical signal, that will determine the way the nucleus of the stem cell works and that yeah. will determine who we become. So literally what we're thinking in our mind and the way we're processing environmental signals will impact upon who we become. So if we get on, this is called nutrigenomics. That's about nutritional information. So we talked about the microbiome yeah. and we can talk a bit more about that. So nutrigenomics and epigenetics determine the end result, which is who we are. You know, so the physical body is really a combination of this sort of step down from all the invisible dimensions that are going on yeah. between our ears. So I agree totally. Regarding the um, aerobic exercise is important, but so is resistance training as well. Yeah. Because the stronger we get in our physical body, you know yourself, if you feel strong, then motivationally Absolutely. you feel psychologically strong. Absolutely. So if we take the mind and the body and the body and mind as being a continuous system, 
What you do in your body will affect your mind. What you think in your mind will affect yeah. your body. So it's getting that right, you see, because Descartes thought that the head was disconnected from the body, but that's not true now. And Bruce Lipton is a genius in this field. You know, I love his work. Biology beyond belief I'm looking at now, you know. I've I seen, I seen the, uh, the lecture you done. It was fen phenomenal. Okay, so I think that bi biology beyond belief means the deeper you go into your core, the more you understand yourself. At depth. Absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. it's almost like an automatic process of healing comes through. Yeah. And we get better connections everywhere, really. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. It's about mindful breathing, meditation, positive emotion. That will then send information back from our heart to our brains. That will then send information through our nervous system to our endocrine system. Yeah. The endocrine system will secrete hormones in a balanced way and that will produce who we become. So balance really starts off in here rather than in here, you yeah, see. Absolutely, so, yeah, absolutely. So I don't know whether to answer your question, but yes, uh, myelinated fibers, I do see that as a super conducting system. And, and obviously, you know, if you, if you stop training, and this is another uh, a sort of big concept. I always imagine the myelinated fibers, the nodes of Ranvier, yeah, yeah, okay, Ranvier, yeah, the way yeah, that yeah. Ranvier, the way they wrap it around. If you don't train and you become atrophic, yeah, okay, yeah. or necrotic in nature, yeah. I imagine it like a hanky around a tight finger. Yeah. And when those, those, you know, synapses stop firing, when those connections stop working, it's like unwrapping a really tight hanky around the finger. It becomes really, really loose. Yeah. Okay, and I think it's worse to detrain than train. I think if you start training and you feel really, really good about yourself and then you take a step back and not do nothing, I think that feeling of not being connected to your body is worse than training in itself, if we you know can, where I'm going with it. We train in gentle ways as well because Tai Chi, Qigong, movement therapy is an importance as well. Absolutely. And, and to, to move with emotion, we can use emotion to actually direct the energy in our nervous system because the heart sends signals out to the brain. Then we release something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, oh. BDNF, okay? The BDNF is really the factor that's needed for neural pathway development. Yeah. So if we're acting in a more positive way with an open heart and positive emotion, right? Yeah. We could call that unconditional love, if you like, but we can talk about that later. You know, we can, we can use that flowing and open feeling. This is like being in the flow. We can direct energy to various parts of our body. And this is what's happening now is Tai Chi, Qi Gong, and medical healing in China, they've known this for a long time. So what we're doing now is we're taking ancient knowledge and new knowledge, combining them together to help a person, but the person's got to take the actions themselves. And I feel as well is that we look at the brain as like, you know, the brain's where it all happens, but I see the nervous system as like a tubular brain, yeah. okay? I, I see it as one connected, and I feel like we're made to move. I feel like if we stop moving, if we stop getting out there, we stop moving the body, I think it just naturally, I think this tubular brain and the brain itself, I think it just naturally gets depressed. Cells are supposed to move, you know, we're supposed to connect we're supposed to feel things around us and I just find that if we're not touching and sensing and seeing and moving and talking and, and getting strong I feel that it, it's a natural depressant in itself how about this we're moving from a linear logical left brain approach right to a multi-dimensional multi-modal multi-sensory approach to life and that's yeah. why we need emotional resilience we need flexibility right because too much resistance training without stretching right you might look good but you mightn't be able to bend down and tie your shoelaces you see Absolutely, so, it's, so yeah. it's always got to be about flexibility we've worked with weight training people in the past Right, who look absolutely brilliant. They've got these things called 12 packs and 10 packs. Yeah. I've got a one pack and I'm happy <laughs> about that. But the point about it is I can't tie my shoelaces, you see, because things like yoga, especially Hatha yoga and yin yoga, they work with energy, they work with gravity and they work with the, no the nervous system, the sympathetic and parasympathetic components of the nervous system. And I want to sort of come right back to that now. And one of the main things I see is if we're constantly stressed out and this sympathetic nervous system is switched on, Okay, constantly. This plays a massive role in our digestive system because the digestive system shuts down. And we now know that heart disease, you know, pathological sort of, uh, of disease within our body, 
pathologies, neuropathologies, these are all affected by the sustenance that we supply to our body. And what we're not looking at is if we're stressed out, and we always we always go with other issues, I think, to the GP. We have aches and pains, and you know, we've got gloopy arms and gloopy tissues, and you know, our breathing's really, really bad. I find that if we're constantly switched on all the time, and this 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 digestive tract is down regulated how are we getting this how are we getting this energy and how are we getting this energy that we require to you know proliferate to to protein synthesis you know to do the things we're supposed to do i call it i think one of the the pinnacles of medicine is a low energy state 99 percent of all issues okay can be associated to a low energy state yeah well we get it by we can take chemical substances Absolutely. Right? Yeah. To keep, we can do that, you know, and that's obviously not the way to go forward. What we need to do is get a balance, and we need to switch off the fight or flight response and increase what's called the rest and digest response. And in the body, this autonomic nervous system, it's got two components. One's an accelerator and one's a brake. Yeah. We've got the sympathetic system, which is switched on most of the time. That's the accelerator. That's the world in which most of us live in. Right, and the brake is also full on at the same time as well. Yeah. So we're almost like burning the brake pads out as well. Yeah. So how do we come to a balance? This is how we come to a balance. We put our hands on our hearts like this. We take a step back and we breathe in a certain way. And if we get down to breathing at six breaths per minute with a positive emotion, I swear to you, Jay, Absolutely. your life will change beyond belief. Okay. But people say, because I say to people, now I'll show them the technique, they feel better. And I say to them, please just do that for the next 90 days, three times a day, 10 minutes each session. That's half an hour a day, Jay. Okay. And they say, I don't think I've got time to do that. Right. Okay. And this is the problem, you see, because our mind, we've got this hurry worry, right? Our mind drives us on and talks us out of what we really need to do. And this is called mindful meditation, if you like. And six breaths per minute, this is what happens is, the vagus nerve, right, which is in the heart, that's part yeah. of, that's the parasympathetic nervous. It's the most important nerve in the body. It's associated with the sacred feminine, right? Okay. The vagus nerve is the nurturing nerve. It can be controlled by breathing, right? Because so when we breathe, we can voluntarily control the way our vagus nerve. If we take our breath to six breaths per minute, it coincides with the way the sympathetic um, nervous system works to regulate our blood pressure. Have you got me? Yeah. So we can, you can breathe in six breaths per minute, all the way in, all the way out, with a positive emotion. We've then forcefully or regulatorily, we've brought both of those working in communion and cooperation with one another. Okay. So we've come from a state of what's called accentuated antagonism or the irritable heart, and we've brought, like in, we've brought in, I'm going to bring a bit of woo-woo in here. <laughs> we've then brought in what's called the mystical union, right? And in that state, the golden child is born, right? Fantastic. And this is the philosophy behind yoga, behind traditional Chinese medicine. And yoga means union. And through breathing in this way, we can bring this union in. Our brains work in a different way. We get expanded consciousness and everything starts to make sense then. Okay, yeah. but it's up to the individual to take time out to care for themselves in this really simple way. I'm developing another thing called chromato-optogenetics. Okay? Stop it, Joe. I can't help it. <laughs> but it's the use of sound and color to actually enhance this effect. So we're in an environment, and this is where the Buddhist bell, bowls and bells and sounds come yeah. in, sound baths come in, because they can increase vibrational rate and resonance, right? Tesla said, if you want to know the secrets of the universe, focus on vibration. energy, vibration, you know, and um, a resonance, basically. Resonance, yeah. And he said, if you start to understand that everything's in vibration and moving all the time, then you can bring this into what's called a coherent state. So we get mind, body, is this okay? Then? Fantastic, so we get Joe, yeah. mind, body, coherence, and then it's almost, and this is what happened to me, is it's almost like everything opened up and I thought, what a silly boy I've been. Why don't they teach you this in schools? And my whole thing now is that I'm trying to get mindfulness and Tai Chi and massage and exercise back into the school playground. Yeah. Right. So that children have got a better start now rather than being battered with academic stuff right from an early age. You know. Fantastic. So uh, I'm, I'm a sort of 
it's really important to me, really. Okay, Joe, so what we really want to look at now is everyone's asking what can be done, okay? So they're depressed, they feel suicidal, what can be done? And what I want to try and achieve is I want to be the, the guy that is a second point of contact from a GP. I feel that exercise, I feel that therapy, I feel like Tai Chi, Pilates, you know, some strength training, some aerobic training, being around someone that's in a, a sporting professional environment is the key to go. I don't want to go from a GP straight to drugs. I want to go a GP to a sports practitioner that's trained in clinical populations. I want to go through therapy to a Pilates teacher, whatever it may be in terms of sport, but I want to see the body moving. What do you think can be done? Well, I mean, I think that you could be more hopeful, right? Because uh, I think things are changing. I do a lot of work in the primary care environment. So I talk to a lot of GPs, practice nurses. So there is a change taking place, you know, um, the enlightened GPs are starting to understand that emotions and mental <laughs> health right, yeah. do have an impact upon physical health as well. So there is a great change that's happening. Um, GPs are talking more about nutritional things as well, which is yeah, very absolutely. positive. They know already about the benefits of exercise, you know, and yoga and Tai Chi and things like that are really coming to the fore now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, so there's, there's no doubt about it that the ordinary people now, you know, who have great sway in these things, are beginning to realise that non-medical interventions are helpful as well. So it's not about fighting against what's gone before. It's about taking the best bits out of the old paradigm and this new paradigm that's being created, taking the best bits out and creating a new model, really. So uh, I think um, more and more GPs are starting to look at health and well-being advice and lifestyle advice and stuff like that. We just need to work together for the benefit of the Absolutely. person and the patient. I think a person like you, and it's, it's heartening to see that somebody who understands the mental side and the emotional side as well, and who's putting all those pieces. To me, a whole human being is physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual Absolutely, as well. Absolutely, yeah. And those four quadrants, and that's what the I am approach is, it deals with a four quadrant approach to what it is to be fully human. And I think if any of those bits are out of balance, then the person will feel emotionally disturbed, really. Ever since I was young, you know, I've only just started looking into it. And this is why we got in touch, really, because I was touching on the law of attraction and, and my reality is a hallucination. And we're looking at biocentrism. I don't know if you've, you've studied, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I really got into biocentrism. Ever since I was a kid, whatever I wanted, whatever I needed, I was in such a poverty-stricken environment, a drug environment, it was horrible. But whatever I wanted always came to be. And I never knew it until, uh, you know, I grew up and I looked into the, the aspect of, of law and attraction. I don't know if you've touched on it, Joe, but this whole law of attraction, which we all seem to be woke. I hate using that terminology. We, we all seem to be woke to. And I want to get a bit, want to get a bit weird now. Yeah. Is, is there that molecular, you know, that quantum mechanic sort of, that law of attraction? If I put out this energy, does this energy come back to me in the same, the same vibration? The answer is yes, I believe it Fantastic, does. Fantastic, Joe. Yes, I know that it does because <laughs> in a quantum reality, we're in this soup, if you like, of energy. And I think really what you do give out, you get back. There's no doubt about that. But the secret was misunderstood in my mind, I think, because people had this ego maniacal view is I want this and I want that, you know, understanding that they could send it out and they would get some success. I find you've got to be grateful, you know, when, when I looked at Biocentrism, Robert Langdon yeah, uh, yeah. had done the book on Biocentrism, this guy's a genius in my opinion. Um, I think what he's trying to say is a bit diluted because we haven't really got the words for what he's trying to to put out there but I think you've got to you've got to be grateful for what you've got you've got to be grateful for what you're asking for to to well, get it back and I think you know th there's a phrase you have to cultivate an attitude of gratitude and when you're feeling depressed and someone tells you that you want to stab them in the head you know what I mean <laughs> but the whole point about it is in the end that's what I've understood is that if you're in a depressed mood you can focus in on what's not happening and what's not working if you can change your gestalt, right, but well, you can't change it from there. Yeah. It's got to come from deep within there. The answer is unconditional love, you know. Absolutely, this might yeah. completely destroy my credibility now. <laughs> yeah. In a, we're moving away from this linear model, right? That's gone now. That's the old paradigm. And we're in this multi-dimensional model now, right? And we can put out a real honest focus. We can send out using the power of imagination, and positive emotion, and we can allow this to come through us, and I think that that will attract the stuff that we need, because there's a greater universal consciousness 
if you like. Yeah. Now I call this the soul, but soul to me means the source of unconditional love, right? Yeah. And I think once you can get back and get in touch with this deep source of what knows what's best for you, right? Some people believe we we signed the contract before we came here, right? Yeah. And once you get in touch with that, the ancient Egyptians knew all about this, you know, that they believe that the whole purpose of life was to find your innate abilities, your uniqueness. Everybody's unique, but nobody's special. But we Completely are. Completely agree, Joe. But we are specialized, right? We're specialized. And each person in my mind has a specific resonant frequency that represents the key to unlocking. Ah, oh, Joe, I love it! <laughs> <laughs> it represents the key. Everybody, every single person on this planet has got a part to play in, into the recuperation, you know, of Mother Earth, really. It's, it's a really, how can I explain this? It's to retune or attune ourselves with the perfect vibration of who we are, you see. And I think we've been misled in a lot of ways, but this is about quantumness and quantum physics has known this for a long time. There's a view now that each individual human being, there's 12 dimensions of possibility. Oof. And once we get into that and deep into the source of our essential selves, we start to understand. So the heart, if you like, is the master, right? Although we've not known that. And that sends out these 12, it could be like the 12 disciples or yeah, whatever, yeah. you know, there's all sorts of correlates here that go with it. But if there's 12 cranial nerves that link with the 12 meridians, right, they represent different aspects and different potentials of what it is to be fully human. And I think people are awakening or becoming woken, woke. right, they're becoming woke to the fact that the human being is much more powerful I'm much, yeah. I'm much more capable. Uh, I completely agree. But if we keep going there, we won't find out the depth of it, you see. Because this is about depth. It's about moving from shallow to something that's got depth and weight. It's about the heart, mate, honestly. And it's about the mystical union, of you like, of the masculine and the feminine. And there's no doubt about it that the sacred feminine has made a comeback in the form of the vagus nerve, you know. Yeah. There's a theory called the polyvagal theory, which explains all this. But the sacred masculine is also making a, a comeback as well. So they're working in harmony. And as I say, when they balance out and work harmoniously, then this golden child is born, you know. And I Fantastic. think most people are understanding this at some symbolic level. Yeah, absolutely. So, so not only am I a scientist, but I'm also a shaman. Yeah. But I'm also a showman as well. Right? <laughs> and I think that's what I've come to is my true purpose is to try and get across this message because it's important that what you're looking for is not out there. It's in there. And on that note, you know, if you if you do want to go a little bit further with what me and Joe are saying, if you get in touch with Joe directly on Facebook, I'm yeah. not too sure if you're on Instagram or yeah. Twitter, uh, and then I am. How yeah. do we get in touch with with I am? Is that directly on Facebook as well? Yeah, on Facebook, there's a link there as well, and I've got the I am uh, YouTube channel is there now. And you know, I've only just started these things because I've sort of got a push to get this information out there. You know, yeah. and, and Jay, I don't know everything. You know, every single day I seem to learn something else. You yeah. know, and the longer I sit down and just open up, it's almost like yeah. information comes in. You know, and that's so it. And it's about, you know, there's no point in just sitting there going, oh, no, I'm not going to look at this. I'm not going to do that. I won't look at Jay's blogs. I won't look at Joe's blogs. You know, what's the harm in looking? Because you're only, you know, you're only improving your you know, your knowledge of what's out there and you don't know until you, until you look. So please do get on Joe's. Please do get on mine. And Joe, it's been an absolute pleasure. You're a good man.